Hello and welcome to this Tetelestai podcast. My name is Jenny Donnelly and we are on a still journey. I hope you are having a fantastic time as we've been talking about a lot of things. We've been talking about fear. We've been talking about my personal story. We've been interviewing guests who've been helping us through this process of finding the realm of rest. And I do want to point out right now that rest is a realm. It's a place. And I think by now you've heard it said that rest is not what we're doing or how we're behaving, or even if it looks like we're being calm, (laughs) rest is a place. And the Bible talks about it being a realm of faith that we can have 24 seven. So I'm so glad that you're with us. And speaking of being with us, my super great friend is here. Her name is Christy McGuyan. And you've probably heard her name before because she is a fireball. She is fired up about life and she has Jesus lighting her up on the inside. But she does have a story to share with us today about letting go of something that she personally probably never would have wanted to let go of. And Christy, thank you so much for being here. I'm so encouraged by your life. I'm so encouraged by your faith. I'm so encouraged by your love and your trust in Jesus. It's really signature to who you are. So thank you for being here. Yeah, I'm so excited to be here with you guys. And what a fun topic. I'm so glad you're doing this for all the listeners too, because especially this one of letting it go, you know, I feel like that happens nonstop in our life, right? We're not thinking right now, okay, there's something else I'm going to let go of. Right. There's something else God's going to ask me to let go of. And I really feel like foundationally for me, it's about our identity in Christ there and go. knowing his goodness, knowing his faithfulness, knowing, you know, and so I'm so thankful um, that he laid that foundation in me through trials, That's right. You know, through letting go of things I didn't want to let go of, through um, realizing there was things I was holding on to that I needed to be stripped of. Okay, so let's let's go right there because you're opening a door. Yeah. And there's a couple of things I've had in mind to talk to you about today. One of them is letting go of something circumstantially, Mm -hmm. something Mm -hmm. that you and I both went through. In fact, I bet a lot of the listeners went through the very same thing or something similar. And I think they're going to find so much encouragement. So I want you to hang on, but I'm feeling right now that we need to tap into the other thing, which is letting go of a false identity Mm -hmm. and even realizing that we might be operating a false identity. Mm -hmm. So before pushing record here today, you and I started saying, man, wouldn't it be great if one of us could sing, let it go. And Christy, (laughs) I have so much faith that your voice would sound amazing. I don't have that much faith in my own, (laughs) but we pulled up the lyrics of the song that everybody has heard. And the younger your kids are, the more you've heard it probably, but it is a pretty famous song and it is Let It Go from Frozen. So we pulled up the lyrics and I want to read this Mm -hmm. and then I want to ask you a few questions and really I want you to dive into how did God release you, release Christy to be who he made you when maybe the world didn't want you to be Mm -hmm. who he made you or maybe Mm -hmm. even yourself, you were afraid of your own identity and your own, um, the way that God made you. We can be afraid of our makeup. And I've been there for sure. But listen to this. The snow glows white on the mountain tonight, not a footprint to be seen, a kingdom of isolation. And it looks like I'm the queen. So this is when Elsa, for those of you that haven't seen the movie all the way through, Elsa is locked up by her parents because she has this superpower and out of her hands comes the ice. And she can do crazy stuff with this superpower. But when she was playing with her sister, Anna, Anna gets hurt by the superpower and her parents go, okay, that is it. We are locking you up. You're going to hurt people with your superpower. So she's been isolated for years. Anna is like, where are you? Why won't you come out and play with me? And it's this thing where this family decides not to talk about it. They lock her up and they move on with their life. And you know, how sad is that? And some people can maybe even identify with that. But let me go to the second verse. The wind is howling like the swirling storm inside. Couldn't keep it in. Heaven knows I've tried. Don't let them in. Don't let them see. Be the good girl you've always, you always have to be. Conceal, don't feel, don't let them know. Well, now they know. And then she just goes into like, I can't do this anymore. And that's when she starts singing, let it go, let it go. Can't hold it back anymore. Let it go, let it go. Turn away and slam the door. So she's coming out of that place of isolation and being locked up. 
I don't care what they're going to say. Let the storm rage on. The cold never bothered me anyway. And this is when she's like building staircases and she's just operating in her superpower, um, risking what other people think of her. So let's start right at that point. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the, the, what stands out actually the most to me in that is heaven knows I tried or heaven wow. knows I've tried whatever. Yes. And, and that, that right there, um, is both, um, there's such joy and freedom in that. And then there's the knowing God's not going to leave us where we're at, right? He's going to, he's going to um, That's right. move us into all he's called us to be. And so I love that. I love that. There's, which way do we look at that? Do we look at it? Oh, I've tried so hard or God has me and he's moving me into all that he's called me to be. And so the freedom in that is so huge. So for me personally, you know, the lap that I always talk about the fact that God um, is so good to us, the whole James verse, the trials, you know, consider it all joy when various trials that God actually has us take laps That's on right. the thing he wants us f- to f- be free of. What we tend to want to do is get off the track <laughs> right? It's hard. Or, 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 you know, run the opposite direction. Right. Yes. But he'll help us. He just builds our endurance and our proven character and our faith, you know, in continuing to bring us. And for me, it was comparison. So that was the lap where, um, and, and I'm not saying that the Lord caused that lap, but he used it for his good. Does that make well, sense? He's saying, you know, there, I'm, I'm, I've burned my image in you. Mm-hmm. That's what the Bible says is that we bear the image of Christ. Yeah. And Jesus had no insecurity. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he, didn't, he never mm-hmm. looked at mm-hmm. Paul or Peter and was like, oh, I sure wish yeah. I was like him, you know? And so, because he had a perfect identity, the only person that ever walked that knew their identity from square one, right? He was challenged as an identity, I'm sure, because he was tempted with every sin. But for you, Christy, I've heard you say that you felt like crazy Christy. Mm-hmm. Okay, expand on the your superpower, yeah. on what was inside of you that you thought, this is hurtful to people. This isn't good for people. And I'm just going to, this is the lap. Yep. You know, when God's like, okay, here we go again. I'm calling you out of the room of isolation and I'm calling you into your superpower. So you said it was comparison yep. and comparing yourself maybe to people who are more calm, more mm-hmm. yes. what? What were you comparing Definitely yourself to? You know, for sure, more <laughs> calm, for sure, more calm. Um, you know, cause I, I, for the Lord is maybe to be passionate um, and to be vocal about that and really to champion other people. And so, I mean, talk about the devil going, Hey, let's get you to compare. So but you won't did even you say know anything that, that that's what your superpower would do. Or did right. you just feel like I'm just annoying people. Yeah. I'm just in people's faces. I'm too much for people. Yeah. Like what were the negative, what was the negative thing that the enemy was telling you that was berating you and degrading you? in your superpower? Well, you know, it really started initially in athletics because I always believed more in myself than most of my coaches did. So there was this belief that there was something greater inside of me that was like, no, like the lid kind of kept being put on. Okay. And so, um, so there always was this feeling of there is more, but I don't know if people want to see that, you know? Mm. What What did you think it might do to people? Would it make them feel like... Ugh, here, here she comes again with her yeah. greatness Ideas and or... excitement and yeah. And, and, um, and just the, like, why are you so passionate? Why are you so fired up about this? Why can't, maybe we should think about this. And I was mm. like, let's go, let it go guys. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, you know, and it really is so cool because the way the Lord has designed each one of us, obviously we know we're uniquely created and designed. And I love, I mean, obviously we know this, but that he takes whatever that struggle is teaches us the truth about it. And then that becomes our testimony, right? So it's no surprise that one of the things I'm most passionate about talking about and encouraging people in is that you're uniquely created and designed. Okay. So you're passionate about that because God had to put you in that teaching spot and say, Christy, you are uniquely designed. You are perfectly designed. Everything about you is actually what I put in you. So is there a moment in time? Is there a season? How can you describe to us this shift? Because if people are listening who go, oh, I feel like there's more in me, but I'm afraid to, I I feel like else I'm locked up. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, it is better that I'm in here because I hurt people with who I am. How... How did that work out for you? Was there a season, a transition, a moment, a, you know, did you get a flash of lightning from the sky? Mm -hmm. Like what Mm -hmm. got you to a place where you like, hold on, I am actually adding value to the world with who I am, not taking away from it. What was, describe that for us. Well, really it foundationally 
for me personally, it always comes down to scripture, like getting that embedded in me. So you and knew something was on off. The truth. Yeah. Did you know like, something was off, and well, now I need to change my mind. I, well, absolutely. When anything that comes in negative against yourself, it's like that's a clue. That's from the enemy. So okay. what's the truth to that? So what's step the opposite number one to that? Is identifying the lie. I think yeah. I'm wrong. Yeah. I'm not supposed to be locked down or be small. So this desire to be small means that I need to, that's a clue yep. that I'm off. And so you said you went to the word. Mm-hmm. Okay. So and there's I think, where I want you to share with and us. And really, you know, for me, scripturally, it's Psalm uh, 139 was the foundational um, revelation. Was wow. that, and then, and then it goes deeper always. I mean, even as I was reviewing, looking at Psalm 139, I was like, oh, Wow. Um, so it's always there. That's what I love. And I guess, um, it's diving deeper beautiful. always in the revelation, but what, Psalm 139, the two things out of that, that really became what I stood on was not only that you're uniquely created and designed that, that, that there's already a plan for your life. Also Jeremiah 29, 11, those two married together, you're uniquely created and designed, which means there's nobody else like you. And the understanding of there's no one else like you, God made that so clear just by our thumbprint. Like That's the, right. the knowledge of all the way down to our thumbprint, that there's not anyone that has ever lived that currently is alive or will ever live after us that has our same thumbprint I mean, yeah, talk, that's wild. That, it, it, to me, that's just mind boggling. And at the same time, so like I, I always, I never know what's more exciting to me, how big he is or how much attention he pays to small details, you know, like, cause yes. you think about that, everything that go everywhere you go, your thumb goes with you as a reminder. <laughs> like when you're starting to think, gosh, I'm generic. Like, I'm generic or what's my, what's the point? Or I really want to be like them. No, your thumb tells you you're not even supposed to be like them. Wow. I love and that. And so, um, so just continuing to press into that. So you really went into a deep dive of, I have to find out why Christy is special. I have to find out everything about me that God put in me for a purpose to bring something of value to the world. I remember that transition too. I remember going from, I'm pretty generic I'm pretty blah. Now that that came out of living a life of sin, quite honestly. Right. After after coming through a life of intentional sin and then giving my life to the Lord and going, oh my goodness, this is horrible how I'm living. My self-esteem was really small. And I remember thinking, I don't know what's special about me. I feel like I am an inch tall. I, have, I don't have much to offer. But I do remember thinking, Lord, you're going to build me back up again. You're going to make me feel like I'm five years old and skipping through the the lawn again, feeling like life is amazing. I'm amazing. And you know, there's not a lot to worry about. I remember thinking, God, you're going to have to build me back up again because a life of sin does saw us down. Yeah, It, It really diminishes us. And other things do too, like trauma, things that are done to us, not necessarily sin that we chose, but things that happened to us. You know, there's all the different reasons why we can get locked down. But the most important thing for a person listening for this particular subject is to say, stop, wait a minute. I do have something special in me because it says so in the word of God. And so now now I need to connect with the truth. Right. And actually for me personally, for me, there was, it wasn't as much of an issue that I didn't believe there was greatness inside of me. In fact, I probably erred on the side of pride mm-hmm. in the sense of, well, I'm going to show you actually there is greatness inside of me. And I, and I was the person that literally thought I could do anything. Right. I literally thought I could do anything. But then as people put lids on me, that's where I stopped believing that. That's where I started to question that. That's where the identity issue. And so for me, it was really then pressing into God commands and controls all things, his goodness, his love for me, his faithfulness. So it's the, the power came not knowing who I was, but knew, knowing who I was in Christ and really knowing first God's great love for me. Because I, I think about it this way as, you know, like it's one thing to, you know, know that someone loves you, but if they don't have the power yeah, then to help you, whatever that is, then it's kind of, it's like, oh, that's so sweet that you love me. If your kids say, I love you, 
it's beautiful. It's amazing. You love that, but they don't have the power to accomplish anything in your life. Right. Right. And so it's (laughs) understanding that God, not only when he says you're uniquely created and designed, I have a plan and purpose for your life. If you don't believe that he commands and controls all things, then that's kind of meaningless. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like, well, that's nice, but it doesn't seem like you're doing Mm -hmm. anything. Let me back up because you said something really critical, so important. And it was a while ago, but you said that you had some coaches that believed less of you than you knew was in you, yep. right? So I think what automatically happens is that we start to prove ourselves. We want to mm-hmm. prove ourselves mm-hmm. to say, hey, there is something in me and you're, and let me, I'm going to have to show it to you, yep. right? So that we get into proving ourselves, which I think would then result in the comparison right. too, right? Like, it's okay. It's a cycle. Mm-hmm, it's a, it's a totally. complete cycle. So- what I'm hearing you say, Christy, is that you had to get out of yourself. You had to let go of yourself. Yeah. You had to let go of of man's approval of you. Yeah. You had to let go of your approval of you. Yeah. And now I'm shifting, letting go of all that. Let it go. That's what this whole way out of chaos into the resting realm is letting go, letting go of trying to find my own approval or approval of man. And now I'm shifting over to what does God think of me yeah. and what God thinks of me and what God is putting in me and what God's doing in me is far superior to what my little tiny opinion is of myself or another man's opinion. So I, I see that you you leaned, you know, we've right. talked about the way right. of leaning, but you leaned into God's opinion of you and his approval of you and off of man. And I can tell you, Fear of man is such a, a trap. It is a snare. The Bible talks about the fear of man and it is awful. And so for anybody listening, if you think, ooh, fear of man, what's that? I don't, I don't know if I've heard that before. Maybe you've heard it, but it is when we want the approval of man more than we want anything, anything. It's like mm-hmm. we want approval of people as much as we want air in our lungs. And so it could be the, we want your pastor's approval. We want, and it doesn't mean we don't need, you know, an attaboy every once in a while, right. but it's like, my identity, I, I, I'm, I'm a generic, useless person unless other people tell me that I'm better than that. And really, you know, who approves of us is God. And the right. Bible talks so much about so God much. approving of us. So let's, let's take a little left turn here. I want to talk about what happens. You know, we've talked about identity right here, and we could talk about this for, you know, many episodes. But in this next half of the conversation, I want to talk to you about letting go of when something hits your life that you go, okay, didn't see that coming. And I have to let go of something that just left my Mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. And for some people listening, it could be a relationship. It could be a divorce. It could be, I mean, we're talking people that have lost children. We're talking people who have lost businesses, people who have lost homes. I know a friend of mine, her house burned down. And it was very, very traumatic. And so here we are saying, okay, we got to let go of our false identity. And now I want to talk about how do we let go of the fear that comes with loss? And so you have a loss, same loss that I have in my history, not too far back history. And just recently within the last year, you and I lost the same thing. And a lot of people listening can probably identify with this as well. But would you share with us just the story of what happened, the loss that I'm referring to, and then explain to us how you're able to let go of the fear that comes with it. And uh, just walk us through some practical things that God did with you so that you can walk in freedom and peace and really in rest. Because when we lose something so important, how do I wake up every day and go, I'm in the faith realm of rest. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm just living in rest. Because the truth is, there are people who have lost things who are living in rest and others who have lost the very same thing and they're living in fear and all day they're feeling fear. Right. And so I want to help as many people cross over that place where they're feeling fear and going into the realm of faith and trust in God. Well, um, you know, for you and I, we were actually in the same business for close to the same amount of time. So blessed to like a month after you got started, meet you um, and be on that journey together, um, be on so much of so many journeys together, right? But um, losing a business that we had poured into for almost 20 years um, that really had become our whole life, you know, really had become 
a part of who we were, um, not only our income, but um, Scott and I, my husband working together Yes, and the ability to pour into other people. So the team, I once explained it to somebody, our pastors, I said, it kind of would be like having a church all over the country um, and actually into Canada that you did relationships with people. You like literally were pouring into their lives. You became friends, you became family That's that right. all of a sudden in an instant without warning was gone. Um, and so in that moment, and I, la- I mean, it just comes back to God's faithfulness. I, I, I don't, I mean, it's hard for me to even hear the word loss because I feel exactly. like everything he quotes. does is for our, our gain. He, I mean, we stand on that scripture that he works all things, all, all, not just spiritual things, you know, not just, no, it's all, that's right. Like all things together for good for those that love him and for those called according to his purpose. And so, you know, um, in those moments, you know, we, we sometimes will never know what he was doing this side of heaven, but we can rest in the fact that he's doing something for our good. And that's just where I went to immediately. It was, and, and, and from his, the faithfulness of those things he stripped away in the past, because for me, all of a sudden realized, man, you're tearing down some idols. And quite frankly, on that day, he answered immediately a whole bunch of prayer requests, not the way I would have answered them. Mm-hmm. And I <laughs> just know, want every <clears throat> listener to understand that we're, we're looking at, okay, I live in this home, yep. in this neighborhood, in this city. Lord, do I need to sell my house? Yes. Do I need to sell my car? Do I need to shift this? Our yep. kids are in private school. Okay. That's probably, you know, I'm, I'm talking when this happened, we're looking at- Everything changes. Everything, everything changes. changes. Really everything. Uh, everything from, you know, I mean, it's especially from an income perspective, it goes from beyond what we could have ever imagined or thought to begin with to nothing. You know, right. and so, and so the, like, there's so much from the natural perspective. Yeah. There's plenty of things. If you look at it from natural eyes to be like, Oh, freaking out, <laughs> you know, what's happening okay, let's talk here about that. What are natural eyes versus spiritual eyes? You know, natural eyes are just assuming that this is the worst and it's, and we just had the best. And now what's going to, instead of going, the Lord's up to something, you know, trusting that he's up to something and he only promises that it he's using it for our good, you know? And so having that immediate confidence in that and knowing that, I mean, even from a provision standpoint, like the littlest to the biggest of miracles that we've gotten to be, to just walk in every day. Okay. So tell us about a couple of the things that God did right away that he never did before, but just to kind of give you a wink, like I got you, I oh got your back. So, I mean, it's like even hard, like, cause, cause the funny thing is we, you know, we all joke, but I'm like, Scott and I were like, did we cause this? Ha ha. Not really. But, um, you know, the year prior, we're like, how are our kids ever going to learn endurance, improving character? They have a pretty easy <laughs> life. Okay. May 17th, you know? <laughs> um, so we're just chuckling at that now. There's so much to laugh at, but, um, you know, just all of a sudden, you know, being concerned that our kids wouldn't even become fearful. Chase, our oldest, had his 16th birthday with our previous business income. <laughs> you know, you've got an expectation there, right? Um, but then our youngest had a birthday two months later. And so things looked totally different. Um, but we had really been excited about, God, what are you going to show our kids? What is this going to mean, the endurance and the perseverance and what they're going to grow into? And, and so he had convinced me that he wanted for his birthday a pizza that was less expensive. Now he has responsibility as one of his strengths, and I know that. And so I was really concerned that he was going to start worrying and being anxious about money. Making decisions out of fear. Making decisions out of fear. And I said, hey, buddy, we, no, we don't need to do that. He had me convinced. So finally I was like, okay, if you really love that pizza, I'll get it for you. Well, someone, a friend of ours turned around and said, I think I can get pizza from a free pizza from such and such a place. And, and Blake was like, mom, okay, let's do that. No, you had me convinced. See, there it is. You had me convinced. And so, um, I said, buddy, you don't need to be afraid. God's going to provide. And he said, yeah, but mom, I know that, but he also calls us to be wise. And the gift of that moment, that miracle of going, man, they're catching it. God, you're, you're creating this endurance and proven character proven character that was just so, encouraging. so sweet. Well, I mean, priceless. You can't put a 
Can't, can't put money on that at all. And so there's just been miracle after miracle of tangible stuff, paid like checks coming in the mail. Um, you know, I believe things that. like that. Um, the very first, the very last day of our official business, like really the last day that we knew whatever happens today is the final paycheck. <laughs> Um, God did the most miraculous thing that made me laugh so hard is we literally on that last day where I was like, am I going to be bawling? Am I going to feel like, what am I going to feel today? (laughs) We had a jacuzzi company at our house measuring for where they were going to put four jacuzzis for a commercial at our house. I couldn't have come up with that myself. Wow. Like I couldn't have even thought of that as provision. Because they were doing that as a, um, like a consulting or whatever you would call it, a, a paid. A paid, just can we use your property to do a photo shoot? So I didn't have to do anything. I didn't even have to like search it out. We weren't even there the day they actually took the pictures and we got a paycheck lit and I'm just laughing. God's just like, I'm going to show you the stupidest way you could ever imagine. You can't even come up with this as an option to show yes. you that I can pull, I'm going to provide from wherever I choose to provide. That's so good. So what I'm thinking about in Hebrews for this chapter, I've just been loving this chapter. In fact, I don't even talk about it in the book because there's so many dimensions of rest. You can't fit it all in one book, but Hebrews chapter four in the Passion Translation talks about, you know, um, ceasing from our work, which I don't think that means we're all supposed to just not go to work today. You know, (laughs) what it means is, is that we don't have to strive. And, but I'm laughing thinking, well, that's a pretty good example of, hey, listen, here's what I'm going to do. And I'm also thinking about how Adam was made on the sixth day of creation Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. on the seventh day, which would be Adam's first day Mm -hmm. alive was the day that God rested. It wasn't like he made Adam on the third day and said, okay, I got stuff started around here, but I need you to go name the animals or or, actually back up because he actually did name animals. Um, (laughs) You have to dog ear that. (laughs) So when Adam woke up on the sixth day, the first day that he was alive, as a human, was the day of rest. So he's looking around going, okay, whew, what could I do around here, God? Let's just see what I can put my, you know, let's see what I can create. And God's like, well, it's actually already done. I already got everything done before I made you. And so to me, this is a perfect picture of God saying, I made you to live from a place of rest And Adam stewarded what God already created, but Adam didn't, he did not carry the stress of making something from nothing. God makes things from nothing. And I feel like there's people listening right now that you've had this false pressure, this false responsibility to make something from nothing. And God was so smart in not making Adam on day two or three, because if I was Adam on day two or three, be like, oh my gosh, there's so much to do. So what did he do? He just said, I'm going to do it all. I'm going to, I'm going to make something from nothing. And then I'm going to give Adam dominion to steward it. So there's a difference between false responsibility and stewardship. I know that you've had a major breakthrough in this area of false responsibility. Would you explain the two different areas of false responsibility that God really broke you loose from? Oh my goodness. I love this right now. And I'm so passionate about it right now because it really was something. And thankfully, praise God, he started working on it in me before May 17th, before the end of our business, because I think it really would have been even a greater struggle. So he was just so gracious and kind to just do it over time in his perfect timing. And that's what we have to keep remembering. Everything's in his perfect timing and we can trust that. But, you know, I had, um, I had believed I'm uniquely created and designed. There's a plan and purpose for my life. God loves me unconditionally I can trust that he's in control. God commands and controls all things. I believed all that for me. And the initial part of my journey was that head knowledge becoming a heart knowledge and walking and living in that. And then I got to have this huge amount of time from even large stages of communicating that to other people and speaking that into and over other people. But there was still a part of me that felt responsible for that for other people. That's heavy. 
And, and, and so it was like, Lord, you've put this message inside of me. You've made this, you've actually made me to be this image bearer of that message. Like that, this is my calling. Mm-hmm. This is my calling. So we can have this calling, but can we rest in God commanding and control, controlling what that looks like, right? So, so then I had this false responsibility. Well, then it's also my job to fix, to help, to advance, to, to yes. if, if, and if, and if someone's not, that's under my care or under my mentorship or under like under my touch, it's my fault. There was, it's my fault. Okay. So what mom or dad cannot relate to this oh right goodness, now or I mean, pastor or business leader. I mean, even if you, as you and I've been talking about this subject this week, I'm thinking, oh yeah, there's that little area right there in my life. My daughter, Hannah, she's 17, but really she's seven in my mind. Okay. Because how did she get to be 17? There's no way. And the other day she goes, mom, I'm going to tell you something and it's probably going to hurt your feelings. And she, I was like, okay, what's coming? And she said, um, I think you're over parenting me. She said it in a different way. And I was like, okay. And I'm like, I think I'm just parenting you. I don't think I'm over parenting you. I was like, I'm, I'm not buying into this right now. And so after her and I talked about it, I, and I did get my feelings hurt initially. Cause I'm like, this is me loving you. This is me helping you. There's yeah, nobody else yeah. in the whole world that's going to step into your life besides your dad and me yeah. and help you get through it. And I'm thinking you have like a year to figure a whole lot out. So you need me more than you think you do. And then after I kind of let the, you know, that, that emotion kind of settle down and I was like, maybe this isn't about me. Maybe I need to just listen and be teachable here. I thought am I over coaching you, Hannah? And she said, she said, yeah, that, that'd be a good way to explain it. And I said, okay, um, you know what? I, I believe that there are some areas of your life that I need to lean on God for. And I think that you're supposed to lean on God for, and I think that's what God's saying right now. So I'm sorry for inserting myself too strongly because she is 17. She's almost an adult. And so I'm like, you're always going to be my baby. And she's like, and that's the problem. (laughs) So, you know, and that's false responsibility because I'm thinking, uh uh-oh, the the clock is ticking. She's going to be 18. Did I give her everything she's supposed to have in her by the time she's 18? I'm probably behind in this area or doing okay in this area. And really this, I've made it all about me and not about the fact that God is her father and he's taking care of her. And so I, I can totally relate to this. And this is an area right now that God's asking me to trust him in. And isn't it funny that we can totally trust trust him in some areas, mm-hmm, like easy, mm-hmm. easy, like no big deal, no big deal right over there. God's got this. I've, I'm, I'm a hundred percent sure he's got this. And in other areas we're like, I've got this, I've, I have to have this, you know? And so I think it's just um, a little bit of fear driven. Um, it's also our strength gone too far, right. which becomes our weakness. Okay. So you and I, and probably every single listener yeah. can think about areas where maybe we're white knuckling it just a little too mm-hmm. much. And obviously we're talking about letting go. So what were some keys that really helped God um, or helped you trust God even more in the areas that you felt you were taking too much responsibility? Yeah. Well, going back to the original verses he gave me for sure, and then applying, like going, okay, that actually applies to them too. And what were some of the original verses? You know, the Psalm 139, and then specifically in Psalm 139, I love that it says, all my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. Like I literally can't change what God's planned. So it's also, am I inserting myself in God as God in someone's life? Wow. And so as he like graciously walked me through that, um, the final piece of it was really only a couple, actually like a month ago. And um, he gave me a dream. And in the dream, I had this world in my hand. And um, it was it was like kickball size, but it was beach ball kind of weight. And okay. I mentally in my head go, oh, this is light. I'm holding wow, the world in its cool light. Dream. So it was like that feeling of, okay, I'm doing better. You know, like I feel like you're freeing me of this, Lord, because I'm holding the world, but it's super light. And I was walking through um, an airport gift shop, kind of the way you would at an amusement park, though, that you have to go through this gift shop holding this holding the world. Okay. And there was these beautiful things and they were all very breakable. And all of a sudden I started bobbling the world and I wasn't concerned for the world, but in my head I go, Oh, see, that's why they gave this to you. When you drop it, something else is going to break. 
Interesting. And so I woke up and I, there was so much to that dream. That's just a snippet of it, but I was praying through it. I'm like, Oh Lord. And right as I like was Lord, what is, and at the same time, it was like false responsibility, but there's just a few fingers left. You know, it was like just a couple (laughs) things left here. And so, um, the next day at church. So I was praying about that and just going, thank you, Lord, that you've freed me so much here and that you're growing me so much in this and that you're showing the pieces that are still there. You know, Next day in church, the pastor, not even anything to do with this, read through a bunch of verses. And this verse, done, sealed, delivered, foundational verse the rest of my life. I mean, this verse, Deuteronomy 32, 39. See now that I alone am he. There is no God but me. I'm like, check and got it. That's and incredible. the next part, I bring death and I give life. I wound and I heal. No one can rescue anyone from my hand. And in that, I'm like, oh Lord, first of all, please forgive me for playing God in people's lives or feeling like that was my responsibility and not trusting you for them. I trust you for me, but feeling like I had to get in there and help you out or something. And then just understanding that there's nothing I can do. If if he's written their plan out before their life even began every single day, I don't want to go in there and botch that. Like, I don't want to go in there and insert right. my life and myself in their life and short circuit the process that he graciously wants to take them through. Because we see people and we we see them struggling in something the Lord's gracious given us grace in or given us breakthrough in. And we kind of almost want to speed up their process sometimes or because we want to save them from pain. Right. And and the Lord, that that's what he uses, those trials. And it goes back to that verse in James. Consider it all joy when various trials. So instead of wanting to remove somebody from the joy and the proven endurance and the character and all the things he wants to do in the trial, you know, we can just, we can sit back and intercede in prayer that's right. and watch God work. Do you think that sometimes the responsibility that we pick up, we're just displacing that burden into inserting ourselves in the natural when in reality, that burden is to be taken to the prayer closet Yeah, and we're supposed to be interceding. I know that there was a time that God proved himself really faithfully in this area where my son was in the backseat. It was when, you know, preteen when they start Mm -hmm. saying stuff that you're like, whoa, (laughs) what's happening? And your child turns into a different child when the hormones come and um, not not bad, wonderful, but um, it just kind of throws you for a loop one day. And so he was in the backseat and I remember just going, okay, hold on. And I was coaching him through changing his words and changing his attitude. And he was digging his heels in and it was like, this is going nowhere. I pull into the garage with him in the back seat, and I just feel like, okay, I have nothing. I don't even know what to do. And I felt the Holy Spirit say, why don't you just let this go and I'll go talk to him. Send me to talk to him. It was like, he was asking me permission. Can I go, can I go take care of this? And I didn't even think for a minute that maybe me trying to take care of it wasn't God trying to take care of it. And it was like, he was like, now, now that you've tried and it didn't work, can I, can I go? But he was asking me permission and he was asking me to send him. It was really interesting. And so I said, Holy spirit, go, go after him and get in his heart because obviously he's not letting me in. And I came in the house and I didn't think anything of it because it was so intangible for a moment because I'm just talking to the Holy Spirit and I don't really know where this is going. And so I just kind of move on with whatever I was doing. And it was not even five minutes and Sam came running down the stairs and he said, mom, I'm really sorry for how I spoke to you and my attitude. And I was like, let me just pick myself up off the floor. I was like, what just happened? And so the Holy Spirit was so faithful because he penetrated a place in my son's heart that I could not get to. Mm -hmm. No matter Mm -hmm. how much love I tried, I used love, Mm -hmm. I used um, threats, I used, (laughs) you know, what I used emotions, I used calmness, I used leadership skills. And I remember thinking, I can't, I can't even help him. And I remember feeling like, well, then that means he can't get beyond this stage if he's not willing to be helped by me. Right. And then here comes the Holy Spirit yeah. and goes, and hey, send used me. used the power of the Holy Spirit. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So I think 
uh, we could talk about this so much because it's such a, a, a fascinating thing. And I really believe that the opposite of letting go is really living a life where we want to control everything and we want to um, be afraid of who God's made us to be. You know, that's what we talked about in the beginning of this podcast is really white knuckling the idea of we are supposed to be a certain way that doesn't match up with how God made us. And then we finally let go Mm -hmm. of that false identity. And then we've also talked about letting go of the, not only the responsibility that we think we have in people's lives that really God has, but letting go of the fear that comes with change and loss is in quotes. Like you said Mm -hmm. earlier, it's because it's not a loss. It's a gain because in the kingdom, God never takes and leaves us empty. He always replaces it. He always, um, he always upgrades Mm -hmm. every single time, every single time. But when we live in fear, we are living in a place of deprivation and lack and poverty. That's really what the vortex of fear does is it pulls us into the opposite of kingdom living. And so Christy, I thank you so much for building our faith and for getting us on the right side of John 10, 10 yes. <laughs> on the side of life, life more abundantly. abundantly, getting us on the side where life is abundant. And Jesus came to give us life. He didn't come to condemn the world. He came to give us life and life more abundantly. And we know that we can trust these things and that we've said, and that we've spoken of, and we're leaning into because Jesus himself said it and he's proven it to you and he's proven it to me and he's proven it to so many people. I feel like, you know, just prophetically, I feel like for the listeners that you need to go into your little file box within and say, Lord, pull the file. The last time that you did something really miraculous mm-hmm. for me, mm-hmm. you did something for me that I didn't see coming. You did something that was like, whoa, like a high five from heaven. And you did it just for me. And it was something that I couldn't have done for myself, but you supernaturally did something yep. for me. And I felt like you were just supposed to review that story and review it and go, oh, that's right. Because it's crazy. The Israelites crossed over the Red Sea, which by the way, split the sea down the middle and they walked on the bottom of the sea, like mind blowing. They get all the way over. And it was within days, I think it was two weeks or something that they were worshiping a golden calf. Yeah. And so it's like how soon we forget, right? I do the same thing. I forget that God had a miracle for me, you know, yesterday or this morning. And so I would actually even like the listeners to think of in the last 24 hours, what did God do for you? What miracle did he do for you? Maybe you woke up and instead of feeling so tired, you actually woke up with a little bit more energy than you normally do. Like that is a miracle. Um, Maybe it was that you and your spouse have been arguing a lot. And really, if you think about it in the last 24 hours, you guys were very pleasant and kind to each other. That is a miracle. Maybe a baby hasn't been sleeping through the night. And instead of waking up three times, they wake up, they woke up two times. Like what is the miracle that God has done for you? And let's, let's go and remember that. Let's go to the remembering room and say, Lord, I remember and I'm reminding myself of how good you are and how trustworthy you are. So Christy, to close this out, would you pray for us and for the listeners to have the courage to let go and the courage to trust God? Father God, I just thank you for every listener that is on this right now. And I thank you, God, that you uniquely created and designed them. Father, I just thank you that you have a plan and a purpose for their life. And it's not anything that they have to do in their own power because you planned every day of their life before it even began. You plan the good works that they would do in advance and they get to just walk in them. They're already accomplished. They're already finished. They are already victorious because they are yours, God. And so I just ask you to deepen their identity in you, and and also their understanding, not just a head knowledge, but a heart knowledge of your goodness, your faithfulness, your love for them. They are your favorite, God. And so I just ask you to help them wash in that, to soak in it, and to believe it with every ounce of their fiber and being, Lord. I thank you that your truth, your word is truth, and their testimony is a reminder of the goodness of what you've done in their life. 
that explodes the lies of the enemy. So Lord, I just pray that they would live on the right, the correct side of John 10, 10, that you have come, Jesus, to give life and give it abundantly. So we just thank you, God, for blessing them, for helping them to see you in all things, Jesus, that they see everything as a miracle and a gift from you, and they walk life victorious in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Christy. And thank you for joining us today for the To Tell Us Die podcast. To stay in touch with us, just visit john1930.com and you'll see that we have conferences, courses, and resources to stay connected with us and to equip you and empower you with all the tools that God has given you for your destiny. It's so exciting. And do not forget to 